Hello, hello, my super expander friends. How are you? I am so excited. You are in for just the most amazing treat inside of this conversation today. I'm sitting here with just a ray of sunshine, a champion for women. And I'm very fortunate to be able to now call her my friend too, which is just warms my heart beyond. I'm so excited to share Rebecca Cafiero with you. I'm so glad to be here in your presence. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm so, so glad to be here in your presence. And I'm just really, really excited to be able to share you with, with the audience today. Just a little bit of context. Rebecca and I met just a few short months ago inside of a hypno breath work certification. And you guys know, cause I talk about it all the time now. I think you hear me talk about it probably on every single episode, but it really was one of the most transformational experiences that I have ever experienced. I was cracked wide open and I was so, so lucky to have been partnered up with Rebecca, with Rebecca and got to know her on a really deep level. And now, now you guys get to, too. I'm here. Yeah, you well, I are. Was, I would say I was also so fortunate to get paired up with you because it was definitely synchronistic because we're, we've got a lot of things in the works that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of touch points that we have common interest and connections and absolutely. Just- it's almost mind blowing that we actually hadn't crossed paths prior to the breathwork certification. I, mean, I think we were actually in, um, in a workshop together a few months prior to that, but re- weren't really like connected officially, officially yet. So we have a lot of overlapping connections and just parallels inside of life and business, which we're, we're going to dive into. And everybody that listens to the podcast knows I waste no time going deep. So let's just share exactly who Rebecca is. Who is Rebecca at the core, at the essence I love, I love this because I'm not a fan of small talk either. I always say I, <laughs> growing up, I felt the loneliest in a crowded room of people that were trying to be someone else. Um, so Rebecca, me, I don't normally talk about myself in third person, but I'm a cheerleader. Definitely. I, I am, my superpower is belief. And I remember when my husband and I met on our very first date, he said, what do you believe in? I said, I believe in myself. Um, and I think that I've seen, I think I know I've seen such a need especially in women of having so much talent, so much passion, so much ability to impact, but not having the belief. So I I think one of my roles here on earth is to lend out my belief and breathe belief into others until they are able to build it in themselves. And I'm also a mom and a wife. I have two, two crazy little kids that almost three and just turned six. I am a podcaster like you. I am a writer. I love writing. I mean, at my heart, I'm a nerdy bookworm and a travel lover and a occasional ballroom dancer. And I am passionate about passion. Uh, I, I, I want to know a little bit more about this ballroom dancing. Tell, tell me more. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I've always loved dance. I was a cheerleader in high school, but I will say I also got very teased as a cheerleader by the other cheerleaders because I did not have a lot of natural rhythm, especially when it came to moving my hips. I am a very white girl and ballroom. What I love about it is it's a combination of technical, but also there's, there's room for the spontaneous, right? I mean, it's not about all having everything perfect and choreographed, which I think is actually really as an example of business, it's like, there are certain fundamentals that you want to know. And then you also just need to step in a place and own yourself, like own your magic and be willing to have fun with it. And also read the scenario, the room, the music, all of that. But I learned how to swing dance in middle school. They used to teach us bar square dancing, square dancing. And then we learned the two-step and really loved it. And in college, I worked at a, I bartended and I worked um, at a couple of different bars and I was sober. So I would often dance with patrons who could dance and did a few competitions. And then in my early thirties, I said, I'm going to like actually do something with this and hired a one-on-one instructor and entered a competition. And I got, I was like the, I don't know, I think it was like rising star, but that was also 11 years ago. And I, I need to get back into it. Oh my goodness. So fun. And I, I know that I think 
something on your, your list, your task list was finding more space and, and room for play inside of our certification. So I just, I just made a note to make sure I check back with you on oh this at a later date. <laughs> you are so good. And I got that email from you as I was like climbing out of the hole of emails from experiencing the sea, you know, and I was like, oh, and that's, that was actually, I don't want to say I forgot, but I had forgotten about my commitment a little bit to play more. And when I came out of being sick for two weeks, literally that was the period of integration of the information, like that I need to play more, but the integration of taking that action item I got out of your hypno breathwork session was okay, Rebecca, this is actually the time. Like you need to do this now. This is not a suggestion anymore. Like me and your body, my body speaking to me, like, we're not going to allow you to do what you've done to us the last 35. Well, okay. I'm in my forties, but you know, since I was conscious about it, the last 30 years of of just go, go, go. And this is definitely the time to play. And I'm very excited tomorrow afternoon after I pick up my son from school or taking the kids for three days to Carmel by the sea. And we're going to, we're going to play with our feet in the sand. Oh, I love that. That makes me so, so happy. Uh, So I want to kind of reverse back a little bit. So when you were talking about belief that that is your superpower. I feel like a, the fact that you're so narrowed in and specific on knowing what it is that in and of itself is, is a superpower because so many people go through life, not really being able to see or acknowledge what their superpowers are, but how amazing is that, that you essentially allow people to borrow your belief in them to build their own. I feel that that is just pure magic. So tell me a little bit about how it is that you came to be so certain in your belief in yourself. Well, it started young. I had um, a tremendous gift from my parents of them trying to keep me very safe. And what that, what that manifested as, as a young person was um, and my, my parents are, you know, they're wonderful. My, they grew up in a small town that their parents had lived in. And my mom is a CPA and if mom, if you're listening, please don't be mad at me, but my mom is a CPA and she, you know, the times that she hasn't played it safe, like she was divorced early and was a single mom. And so she was really trying to have certainty. And I think that's what a lot of this is, right? Is certainty. So here comes me as you know, the firstborn, And I am this very, outspoken, loud, passionate child who was like, I am going to do this and this and this. And her and my stepdad really tried to keep me safe by saying, you know, lower your expectations or that's not possible. And not from a standpoint of trying to hurt me, but from a standpoint of trying to protect me from disappointment. And in the way that I chose to see that is I will show you from an early age. And so, you know, they used to say I was rebellious and I used to say, no, it's just give me a good challenge. Tell me something that I can't do. You know, now as, as I've matured, I've learned just because someone tells you, you can't do it. Doesn't mean you should, you need to make sure that it's in alignment with you. You know, I definitely got myself into trouble sometimes doing things because it was, it was forbidden. Um, fortunately, nothing that's on my legal record, but I, I you know, went through that with them. And so there was a lot of me when I wanted to do something that they didn't approve of and whatever it was. And usually it was something like I was very involved in school. And so I had an opportunity, my, my summer of my sophomore year. So I was 16 to spend three weeks at something they called Oregon governor school. I'm from Oregon and they picked one kid per County. So this was an achievement. This is a very cool thing, but my parents saw it as three weeks away for our 16 year old living on a college campus in the dorms with 30 other 16 year olds. Like this is absolutely not going to happen. And, and I think at the time we had to pay, I think it was a few thousand dollars to attend it. Even if you were chosen, you still had to to pay. And so they said, you know, we're not, we're not going to pay for this. And so I went out and said, okay, I'm going to get a scholarship for it. And I found a local commission that needed a youth representative applied to be their youth representative and then applied for their scholarship. And I got it. And it was one again, not wanting to be told no, but it was also, and this is, this is by the way, people, because I, you know, this is 20, no, 20, this is like 26 years ago. And this is before Google or any of that. So this is like in the day you had to go to your guidance counselor's office and everything was paper. And it was, you know, even finding someone to drive me to the meetings in the middle of the school day. Um, it's like, how bad do you want it? But it's also how resourceful are you going to be? 
and not saying, well, my parents won't pay for it. So I can't do it, but like always looking at how can I? And so that gift of them giving me some very healthy obstacles to really have to overcome. And then because of our um, relationship, um, I found myself my senior year living on my own, completely independent. And that was a very scary thing, you know, to be in high school and to be paying for all my own bills, having to like navigate college. In fact, I'd taken all these AP classes and I didn't even know that those, I didn't understand that they actually transferred to college. I went to not the great, greatest school and I probably missed some appointments with my guidance counselor because I was working like 30 hours a week as a waitress my senior year. But, and I missed the introduction at my college because I was also working to save money for school. But I learned that I was the only one I could rely on at that time. And, and that can sound really, I think that can sound really sad and really lonely, but it wasn't, it was a gift. Now, in my older years, I learned that it's a really beautiful thing to be able to ask for help and to rely on someone else. But um, but I didn't have a safety net. So I had to become my own safety net. And there were definitely days that I like wrote my check out for my apartment, knowing I didn't have enough money in my account, hoping they didn't deposit it till Monday after I deposited my, you know, waitressing tips from Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But that was really it is I just had no one to call. I had to rely on myself. So I figured it out. And that belief muscle that I built so strong at an early age, like there's muscle memory there. And there's been times in my life where I've been going through some really hard things. And I just remember one of them, I, I had a good friend that had moved in with me. Um, he was going through a divorce and he said, Rebecca, you know, can I come stay with you? And, and it was supposed to be a few days and it turned into like six weeks. And um, he ended up having, I mean, he was going through some, a lot of stuff, but he ended up having an emotional breakdown and a mental breakdown. And I've never, it's, it's a really scary thing in, in this world of mental health to actually see someone mentally break, like an incredibly scary thing to the point that, I talked to his family and, and, and we agreed that the best thing to do because we were concerned he was a danger to himself was to actually have him committed. Um, and I was on my way to the hospital or the institution. Um, and I had already had a bunch of stuff happen because he like said his mind kind of broken and I've actually never shared the story. Um, so you are so good because you're just allowing me to open up, <laughs> but I had already dealt with the night before he had been, he'd been picked up driving, um, under the influence of, of not, not, well, I think it was just medication. And so I had to go and like bail him out of jail, get his car out of the impound, like get his, his dog. Um, it was already very stressful. And, and then I'm trying to do this while navigating the fact that I have a job and I have employees. And I was, I would say I was close to my breaking point. So I'm driving him to this last seat or last bed, I guess, at um, a mental hospital so that we can get him the help he needs. And I had a blot on the freeway driving him. And this is a person that is completely lost their facilities. And so having them run up and down the 405, as I'm trying to get them into a car while I'm waiting for the police, because I, I called the police again, I was like, I need help. I can't contain this and AAA. And my husband and I were very early in our relationship. I think we've been dating maybe eight weeks. Wow. And I called him and I remember him. He's like, Oh, I'm like, this is what's happening. Like things are going crazy. And he's like, do you want me to help? And I said, actually, no. And I said, because right now I'm so close to myself losing it. I'm afraid if there's someone here to support me, I will lose it also. Like I am, I am done. I didn't mention that I was so, I was so upset the night before of having to like bail him out that I had gone home and drank a good amount of wine. And I was also not feeling my best. Um, but now I'm in a different place where I'm, I am able to ask for help in my life. But it was really from that of like knowing that if there's no other alternative and failure is not an option, that you will find a way. It is, isn't that the truth? And your belief muscle combined with resourcefulness, it's literally, I think that that combination makes you unstoppable in so many ways. I, and what I heard from so much of that, and I feel like I identify and like resonate with so much of that is that yes, there's a time to accept help, and, but it's actually a choice of being able to receive it. And there is this yes. really comforting thing to know that you don't need it, need it in the way that you, you could do it on your own and, and you're welcome in the, the support and the receiving of the support, but it's not because you're helpless or that you can't do it on your own. It's just nice to receive support. Yeah. I mean, at, at a point it becomes about quality, right. And it now as you know, a mom juggling 
you know, a business, well, and really multiple businesses. And I mean, my husband's a founder and, you know, just a really full life. Like, could I do it on my own? Absolutely. And, but do I want to, like, I I've learned that I can drop the badge of busy. I can drop the mommy martyr. Like I don't need those things because I would rather choose a state that's a little easier. Now I'm not saying life is always easy. And I'm not saying that, um, like that I don't ever have times that I question myself. It's, it's how long I question myself. You know, I get moments of comparison like anyone else, but I don't allow myself to sit there. Like I know the tools and, and like you, right. We've done a lot of personal growth and I know the tools to ask myself or who to reach out to, to get a wake up call or a, you know, accountability check to ensure that I spend moments there or maybe hours at the worst. I don't spend days or weeks in a place that doesn't serve me or my goals or who I'm serving. And that's a huge differentiator for those that like really are successful is how long you linger in the, in the moments where you trip and stumble or in the hard spots. It's when you pick yourself up from your bootstraps and just, just keep on going. So I would, how did you end up or make the connection of taking your superpower of belief and turning that into a champion for women? Mm. Well, I've always, I've always just been, I would say the, the person that like roots for the underdog. Like I was a kid in probably first grade. And I think I'd ask my mom, I said, mom, I'm gonna ask you a question. Don't lie to me. Is Santa real? And she said, she looked at me, she said, no. And then I said, okay, I go, but I'm not, don't, I'm not telling anyone else. And I, at school, when kids, you know, believed in Santa and some other mean kid would come and say, Santa's not real. And I'm like, don't you tell them that, like, let them believe in the magic as long as they can. But I've always been a champion for the person that maybe doesn't have as much. Um, and, you know, I've seen as a woman, you know, as a woman that got into corporate America early, I have seen that women are, you know, off the, I mean, I don't, have, this is not new information. Women are paid less for the same positions, um, the way that they're treated. And, you know, I worked in a field for 12, 13 years that was very male dominated. And, and I'm not saying it was, it was a bad area. And I had some wonderful male mentors. I also had some very poor male mentors. And I had some, you know, bad female um, bosses as well, but I was in real estate development. So new home building. And I remember I was at a meeting and they had brought the VP of sales and the division presidents. And there was I think 50 divisions at the time. And out of 50 division presidents, there was one woman, one. Now, fortunately, by the time I left my career, by the time I left that, that job, well, left my job, left my career and became an entrepreneur, um, it was getting a little bit more even as far as like a VP of sales. I was a VP of sales. And I think at the time there was 12 of us and there was four or five that were women. So it wasn't as unheard of. Um, but it was still just a very male dominated industry. But the, here's the other thing I saw. I manage salespeople. Salespeople tend to be pretty confident beings. They're also emotional beings, which there's nothing wrong with. But when I made this transition um, into entrepreneurship, initially it was really in the health and wellness space. And what I noticed is that there were so many women that were so passionate, so talented, like so purpose driven. And I would say, not that men can't be purpose-driven, absolutely they can, but I saw the women typically as a percentage being significantly more purpose-driven over profit versus men being more profit and then purpose, if that's great, if it's, if it's there. But I saw them lacking the belief in themselves or I saw them having a very different responsibility, especially if they were a mom. And you know, we can go back to two years from, or two years ago, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I have young children and most of my friends have kids that are, elementary school or middle school, watching what was happening to women, especially many of the women that I coach that were business owners who their partners' lives weren't changing significantly. But when the nanny couldn't, you know, nanny couldn't show up or the kids weren't in school or whatever, you know, the mom all of a sudden who already was typically doing a lot more. And again, I'm, I, I know that there's a lot of exceptions and I actually have three good friends that their husbands like cook and like, take the, like they do a lot of the, the things that 50 years ago were considered female, um, female responsibilities. But I saw the way that women were completely set back. I mean, decades. And you can look at the stats in mental health and you know how this has impacted them. Um, and I already was working with women at the time because I just said that the way that women open up with each other is so different. And yes, some really exceptional facilitators can create a container 
Um, I mean, Tony Robbins is very good at this, but it's still very masculine, right? Like a container where you can really be you, but it's very different when the energy is just women. It's different how you show up, how you're vulnerable, how you share. And there's a lot of women that will never raise their hand in a room with a bunch of men who are already raising their hand. You know, and some of it is an age thing. I mean, it definitely, I think is more prevalent in, you know, 35 plus, but I wanted to work with women because I could see their passion, but also that missing bridge of the belief, the, the confidence, the, the certainty. Um, and again, I also saw that when, you know, as women have children and again, anyone out here, that's a mom that's listening, that they typically take a step back. It's, it's one of two things. It's either you go back to maternity leave or from maternity leave, like six to eight weeks after having a baby, which no one should do, like biologically understanding what happens to our bodies, or you take a huge step back for years and then you start over. And I just felt like that was unfair. And so, you know, I'm passionate about helping all women, but I'm really passionate about helping women that are not necessarily just moms that are really trying to design a life that they've been told or shown is impossible. I love that. It really attaches right back to how essentially how you were as a little girl. And I love that because you're (laughs) bringing that, that spitfire sort of watch me, tell me I can't and watch me. I'm going to show you that I can into a really impactful way in, in your adult life and really supporting women in building businesses and showing up confidently. So let's talk about the progression from, from when you were, when you've had, it's, there has been a progression, right? It was oh, yes. real estate is, or does it go further back from that? Well, so journalism actually. So I, I wrote, I mean, I started writing in middle school. I actually, I started my first short story that I went to like a writing contest for. It was in fifth grade. Um, but I wrote my yearbook in my newspaper in middle school. And then in, in, um, high school and then in college, I worked for a daily paper for three years. I absolutely loved it. I mean, it was, it still is one of like my favorite memories is, is the pressure of a late night deadline of like the scramble of coming out of a city council meeting at nine o'clock and having two hours to, you know, turn around 600 words. I love that. And I definitely honed my ability to write, you know, and write on demand. Um, and then the thing is about writing though, is that it paid so little, so little. And in 1999, 2000, 2001, when I was writing for a paper, they were not teaching you how to monetize your passion as an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, if you can get a job with an LA times you know, desk, you could make 25,000 a year, which is below poverty level. So I said, I love journalism, but I was already working full-time basically through school. So I, I would bartend or waitress five shifts a week. I had a, an every other weekend job as a makeup artist. I worked conferences, conventions while working at the paper and going to school full-time. And I just was like, this isn't sustainable. And I don't want to have to have a side job to support my real job, which you know the newspaper was, but I was making less than minimum wage because we were on salary. And so I decided inst- I was going to go to law school. I moved to LA to establish residency for the year. And in that year, I was working at a real estate office and getting some exposure to it. And then at the time, my boyfriend, his mom was in real estate and he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to move out to Vegas. And this is 2003. It's like, I'm going to move out to Vegas because everyone out there is making like 200,000 a year and, you know, or hundred thousand a year. And that just was unheard of money. And so I was actually, again, not a story. I don't know if I've shared. I was out working a it was the lingerie and nightclub convention, I think. Um, I was working for a night nightwear club company and he was out there interviewing. And when he interviewed, they said, it's too bad you're not a recent college graduate. We have this specific position, that, but they still hired him. And he said, well, my girlfriend is. And I went that night to like Myron Frank, bought a suit and went and had an interview the next day and got my first job in real estate. And I was really fortunate to work for a company that had an unbelievable training program. We had 90 days of training before we ever were allowed to sell. I mean, they really invested in us. And I can remember being early on in sales and, you know, I learned everything the good way with no bad habits. And I would, I sold everyone. And what I mean by that is my first, my first month that I was able to sell after getting my license, coming out of training at the time we had 10 salespeople in our sales office. 
and we had 30 lots. Was it 30 lots available? Yes, 30 lots available. We would have get 30 lots to build homes on every two weeks. We were a massive builder and it was all done by drawing because this is during the real estate boom. And my first drawing out of the 30 lots with 10 of us, I got 15 lots because I had, I had basically, I think I'd had 37 or 38 customers that had walked through the door in my first two weeks. And out of that, I had 30 of them gave me a deposit check and an EMD check because I just believed that every single person wanted to buy a home from me because we had an incredible product. One is because I really didn't know what was out there in the market. So I believed that our product was the best. I believe that we have solid surface oak, or solid surface countertops and oak cabinets. Oak is not what you want. I mean, that, that wasn't even cool in you know, 2003, but my belief was contagious and that certainty and that's why I got those results. And that's something that, I mean, that's a, that's a sales thing in general or really a goal thing. Um, but I was in that position for a few years, did really well, then got moved into sales management and you know, ended up my last five, six years of my career, either a director of sales or a VP of sales. And I loved it. I loved the opportunity to train. I loved the ability to manage people. But what I didn't love is that I was often setting benchmarks or restricting, I should say, capping commissions. And that was completely not aligned with me because as a salesperson at heart, I don't ever believe that your income should be capped, right? Yeah. It should be limitless. It should be like whatever you can create because it's just a sign of your value. And so I just got to that point, you know, working for two different publicly traded companies. I learned so much. I'm so grateful for that time, but I realized that I was operating in my zone of excellence and I didn't know what that was then, but I was like, you know, I love 5% of my job. I like like 25% of it. I'm really ambivalent about 50% and whatever is the remainder I don't like. And it was really scary to go out on my own and to leave not just, you know, a quarter million dollars of guaranteed income a year at 30, I think I was 34 when I left, but also the prestige, the prestige of being the youngest VP and one of the few female VPs in a publicly traded company. And, you know, that, that was the hard part is the the perceived loss of esteem that I walked away from. People are like, what are you doing? You're, you're going to leave this to be a coach. What? And then you stepped into the, but watch me. Oh, I stepped into the roller coaster ride of entrepreneurship and I have not gotten off. <laughs> and what a ride it is. It That's is. a great. So tell, tell us a little bit, tell me a little bit more about when you stepped into that entrepreneurial journey on your own, building what you've built. Yeah. What inspired that piece in terms of, because a lot of times you, you would jump into entrepreneurship or coaching and then it's like, hold on. And there's so many pivots and twists and turns along the way. I feel like right now jumping into entrepreneurship because we're in a gig economy the last few years, it's, it's much more common, but this was eight years ago. So this is 2004. Yeah, no, two, two, 2014, 2014. And actually what happened is I already in my mind was that, well, I'll go back. Um, when I was 28, my boyfriend at the time got diagnosed with stage four cancer and I was in a really toxic work environment then. And I had this constant balance of like, okay, I want to be at his chemo or there the day after, which is usually when he, cause he would be hospitalized after cause he always got so sick. I want to be at, you know, his chemo appointment and be there to be with him and support him, but I also need to be at work. And so it was this constant juggling and, but I didn't have a choice because I was also digging my way out of the hole that happened when the real estate market crashed. And again, I was in Las Vegas, you know, kind of the epicenter of the crash. Um, and, and he ended up passing away and, you know, that, that taught me a lot. I mean, I dove really into health. That's where my passion for health started. I've always been interested in personal optimization, but all of a sudden, you know, after losing someone very young, who was very healthy um, to cancer, I just got very, very motivated and committed. Um, and then I met my husband and my husband, when I met him, this was 11 years ago, had already gone through cancer once, thyroid cancer. Um, and no, I did not. There's no cancer like patient app out there for dating. It was just match.com actually with both of them. But I met my husband and I was, I was at well, I was at one job and I was waiting for a transfer from being a sales manager to a VP of sales for another division. I was moving up to NorCal from SoCal and I had my first day arranged, like all the sales offices were shutting down. I was doing a, you know, a big talk, meeting the ops team, et cetera. 
And about two weeks before my husband had been re-diagnosed with cancer almost a year earlier, but about two weeks before my first day at this new job within the same company, they scheduled my husband's surgery for the same morning. And I remember going, do what, what do you want me to do? And he's like, you know, I just, it's fine. You don't need to be there. Like there's nothing you can do anyway. You're going to be in the waiting room. And so I, I just said, I said, I just, I'm so worried if I ask them to reschedule with like 40 people that were affected by this, they would, they would see me as flake. They wouldn't see me as serious. It would affect my, my job security and, you know, job security, having been on my own financially, um, since I was very young was, was really important. And so I made what I felt like, I didn't feel like I really had a choice. Um, and when I left that meeting and drove to the hospital, like I was like bawling my eyes out. I just said, I'll never be in a position where I don't feel like I have a choice. And that was the first year of that job. I worked that job two more years. And again, it was actually, that was actually, a, it was a great job. I had a phenomenal team, but it planted the seed of Rebecca. There's no way that you can be the type of parent you want to be working this job where I was in a hotel two or three nights a week, where I was commuting two to three hours a day. I mean, I was working 60 plus hours a week. And so I started looking for an exit. And initially I've always loved photography. Um, the year before I left my job, I actually was like, well, maybe I can do photography. In hindsight, it was wedding photography. In hindsight, I would have to work weekends, which my husband was an, is an engineer and he would be working the week. I'd never see him. And, you know, and, and then also like the max you can make really, I mean, I don't want to limit myself, but hundred thousand dollars for a wedding photographer is a phenomenal income. And I said, that's a huge cut. And we live in the Bay area. It's the most, like literally we live in the most expensive city in the United States. So, um, I just, I was just open and I ended up going through a health transformation that year, getting ready for my wedding, um, was introduced to a company, a network marketing company. And I, I didn't have a negative, uh, mindset about network marketing. I didn't really have anything, but I have always been open to opportunity. And I said, wow, these products are amazing. And I was like organically sharing them with friends, earned a few thousand dollars. I didn't even know I got, and then started looking at it. And I looked at the opportunity and I said, I don't know that this is like the thing, but here's what I know. I naturally share anything I believe in. If I just am a little bit more intentional about it, then this could be the bridge for me to leave my job. And then I have freedom bandwidth to really figure it out. And long story short, um, in about six months, I was able to replace my salary, not my bonus. I, I made like an extra 60 grand that year. So I was able to pay off all like my car loan, like everything, put some money in the bank and was able to leave the last year. And the funny part is I only, I really only like fully pursued that business, which is still, I mean, I use the products. I love it. I love the company for about three, maybe four years, three and a half, four years. I really built it. But then I just was like, you know what? This is still not my thing. This is a zone of excellence, not my zone of genius. And in that though, I was coaching and mentoring a lot of nutritionists, a lot of chiropractors who are utilizing this product in their practice. And I saw that mindset of like the broke healer, the person that is doing this mission-based business, but really having a hard time with charging their value. And I was coaching them and all of these things. And I said, wait a second, I don't want to just work with people in health and wellness because I started having other people ask me like, Rebecca, look at my business or what are your thoughts? And, and I was able to take you know, more than a decade of sales and marketing experience with my love of like messaging and storytelling and bring it together. And that evolved more and more and more, but long story short, um, I got the idea for the pitch club two years ago and it launched it about 15 months ago. And the success, the quantum leap that, that has been experienced and more importantly, the traction that our clients are getting is only because I've owned the magic and the mistakes of everything else I've ever done. And I figured out how to wrap both that experience of both into something that I can deliver a value to the world. That was a long answer. I was here. I was saying it. Uh, they, they can't see the, the video here that <laughs> of us, <They> were not. <laughs> right. I'm, I was like hanging on your every word. So, <laughs> and as, as is everyone listening. So I would love to know before we get into, cause I'm going to ask you who you're, who has really been a proponent, like a, a super expander for you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to really share a super expander story with us, but if someone is listening, that's like, how exactly do you start to nail down 
and drill down to really what is your zone of genius? Like, and what's the difference between a, a zone of excellence operating there and really stepping into your zone of genius? How, how do you find it? How do you know? Okay, I'm going to love that question. I'm going to give everyone a resource. So first of all, zone of excellence is where you're doing something that you're good at. This is, this is like quicksand though, because it traps you because you get paid for it typically. Well, people even compliment you on it. You deliver value. So from a surface standpoint, it's a feel good, right? Like we like to be told we're doing a job. We like to be paid. Well, zone of genius is typically where you're in flow. It's the highest expression of your creativity. It feels like it takes the least work. Typically it's something that takes advantage of natural talents and it's what you really enjoy. So that's actually why I coach women. It's not that I couldn't coach men. I'm excellent at coaching men, but it's a completely different way I show up when I'm sitting across from another mom and we can talk about like, or another woman, and we can talk about things like not being seen and heard, not feeling valued, like where this started in childhood and how it's manifesting or blocking them in their adult life. Um, but I will say there's actually an extension of this that I really love and it's called Ikigai. I'll spell it out. So if you want to Google it, it's I K I G A I, and it's a Japanese term that means reason for being, but I also like to say it's like entrepreneurship. It's like enlightened entrepreneurship and it's finding the hub of what you love, what the world needs, what you're, they say good. I'd say, you know, start a good um, or great and what you can be paid for. Now, the ironic thing is the being good or great at something. If you love it, you're going to invest the time. Like I loved photography. And when I invested a year into some workshops and, and, you know, growing my skills, like I got really good, really fast. It's really hard to do that with something that you don't love. Yeah, it is right. It feels like pulling teeth the entire time. So pay attention to the things that really, really lights you up and, and doesn't necessarily mean that it has to come easy, right. But that you're really willing to go all in and invest the time to learn, explore, or get really curious with. The opportunity is going to open when you do fall. I, I hired my first life coach at 26 and that was again, 2006. This is long, like life coaching was not a thing then. And I remember our first meeting um, I sat down across from her and it was, it was like a three hour in person. It was so cool. I look back to what I paid. And I was like, wow, now I would want a business coacher on raising her prices because <laughs> the value she gave was amazing. But she asked me, you know, like, what are your, you know, kind of what are your dreams? What are your goals? And I proceeded to basically give her a forward projection of my LinkedIn resume. Like, you know, I'm doing this and this and this and this and by 45, I'm going to be the CEO. And then she's like, she sat there and just paused and she's like, Rebecca, what do you really want? And I, totally broke down into tears. And, you know, what was happening is again, I was in my zone of excellence. I was, I was becoming excellent at what I was doing, but all the things that I was passionate about writing, speaking, theater, all of these different creativity wasn't happening. And so I made a, a joy binder and I started like infusing more joy into my life. I signed up for photography and theater and circus school classes but what happened is it was like putting, it's like putting truffles and like the best ingredients or the best toppings onto a cardboard sandwich. Like it's slightly more palatable, but you're still eating cardboard. You know, if, if the main thing does not nourish you, light you up, fulfill you, like you're always going to be searching. Such a, such a good advice and, and tips on how it is that you can, you can nail down and distill that. So on your journey, so many times, I am sure because there, it's been a, a very long, I mean, not very long, <laughs> not to it's, say that. it's been pretty long, <laughs> but I mean that there's been lots of different experiences along yes. the way there has because been, I say yes so much. I live, I don't say I live fast. Cause that sounds like, you know, drugs and alcohol. And I'm ironically like don't really, I don't drink, don't do drugs, any of that. Um, but I think it's because I, I'm really open to saying yes. And I'm open to failing forward fast that it feels like I've had nine lives already. A rich life experience. It's yes. all like once one is, is done, then it's on to the next, the next experience. I love that. So along the way, there had to have been some really big influences, impact. People have inspired you, people who have called you up that have expanded you, shown you that 
all of this is possible and proof. I'd, I'd love if you could share a super expander story or two. Oh my goodness. Well, I definitely mean, I know you and I both love Lori and Harder or Lori Harder and Chris Harder, the Harders. And, Absolutely. and I actually, I met them in network marketing and I think I was with my company just for a few months before I was at a lunch and I was uh, like rank advanced and I happened to got, get sat at the same table as Chris Harder next to him. And he was just so wonderful and so helpful and so real. And, you know, this is almost 10 years later, he's still the same person. He's just, he's just even more expansive. Um, so he, they've always been, but also my husband, um, which is, I'm really fortunate that he, I will say I've always prided myself on typically I've been further ahead of most of the guys I've been with. Um, and when I say that, like I met my husband, I was 31, he was 27. He had done a master. So he was only a few years into his, into his career. I was nine years into my career, eight years into my career. And so, you know, I had a higher title. I was making more money and I loved it. I loved it. I was like, you know, I'm powerful. I'm a strong woman, all of that. Um, and of course, Tony Robbins always is an expander. I had seen Tony. I think I'd seen Tony. And long story short, I bought Date with Destiny tickets. I'd never been to a live event of his, bought Date with Destiny VIP tickets. And I told my husband, I want you to go with me. He was not, he was, he came from like the, the education school, masters at Stanford, um, MBA at Wharton. And he, well, actually they did the MBA after. So masters at Stanford, very educated where I come from a very different background. Like I, I got a four-year degree and, you know, my mom is one of, two in her nine siblings that even have a degree. Um, but I took him to that event and it just, it totally changed his life. I loved it, but he came home and he applied for the MBA and ended up quitting his job and started a startup, which he, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what I asked him about his success that was unbelievably successful and in August was purchased by John Deere. It was our third largest acquisition. And I mean, it was, it wasn't just that it obviously created a huge impact in our life, but even some of our like friends and family who'd invested to see them like have some life-changing, you know, money come. Yeah. Um, but the other side is I asked my husband, cause I was like, you know, like you just did something that, I mean, he was, he was in Times Square on the, what is it? The NASDAQ, like fair flag, you know, robotics, that's his company. I mean, like, how the hell did you just do this in four years from literally playing with this toy dump truck of my son's um, to building a company with a quarter of a billion dollar valuation? I was like, how did you do it? Like, wh what was it? And I'm, I'm his wife. I got to see the behind the scenes every single day. And he said, Rebecca, I did something every day that I was afraid of. And I went, wow, I'm not doing something every day I'm afraid of. Like, yes, I love personal growth, but am I really facing my fear? No, I, I still can't say I'm doing it every day, but I'm, I'm better about it. And what happened throughout that whole process is we were pretty level before, you know, and I'm, I'm holding up my hands here, you know, and sometimes he would pull ahead and sometimes I'd pull ahead. And it was never about like being better, right? It's about, it's about calling up. It's about loving the person you're with and also wanting to continue to show them like your value in a, in a, in a way that is not about proving yourself, if that makes sense. But he just showed me this quantum leap of possibility. And this is the person I spend the most time outside of my children with. And that's when I said, I think I'm actually playing it way too safe. I played the support role for the last four years to ensure that he could live out his dreams while I also you know, built mine. But I'm like, I played it too safe. He just completely expanded the possibility and the ironic thing is, is a few months before the acquisition is when I was introduced to Francesca, who I'm sure you've talked about on the podcast. And I will say, and I love you, Francesca, if you're listening to this, she's an expander, but also because she scares me. Like she is a call you up person. And I don't mean scares like in a bad way. Like she, she calls you out, it calls you up because she can see exactly what's going on. And she was I had gone to total group coaching. She was one of my first one-on-one -on -one clients. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. And long story short, because of her and because of hypnobreath work and because of what you and I are now working on with her, it's, and the tool of hypnobreath work. I know you all know from Corey, how amazing it is, but like the most powerful tool I've ever seen. I did two sessions yesterday. I was shaking. I literally like, I've got my big book of ideas. I came out with pages of notes. 
and maybe a startup idea. Ooh. And I know I'm pretty freaking excited. I'm in top time to do market research, but I'm just excited. But having those people in your life, like my husband, like Francesca, like, like Chris Harder, who are living in the fullest expression of themselves and want to send the elevator back down. Like, I think there's nothing better than that, right? Is, and then also facing that fear. So Chris told me, you need to reach out to Rob Murgatroyd. Oh yeah. And yes. And he's like, you need to reach out because you need to do this thing. And I like, I was like, okay, I, I have a call with Rob tomorrow. You know, if being willing to have a conversation, being willing to take the messy action, billing, you know, just be willing and open. Wow. I still on all of that. Are you, are you going to go to Italy? Are you going on, on the boat? Well, oh my gosh. So I don't even know about that, but I will say, well, I'm not really still talking. So we went last year in October after the acquisition, we, we took off, I took off two weeks. My husband took off like 10 days and we did the Amalfi coast. So I'm, when I saw it was a Malfi, I was like, I mean, yeah, I'd love to go again, but I, I don't even know the details. So I'm sure I'll hear them tomorrow, but hopefully <laughs> I will be. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so exciting. And I love that. I'm so inspired by even just like, as you're I'm like watching your hands do the moving up piece. It's like, really, I think when you're referring to the, like your, the relationship with your husband and really that dynamic, I think that that is to have that in a partner is got to be the most amazing thing because the idea that you both are consistently, constantly seeing the greatness in each other, even when the other person maybe isn't actually fully aware of it and, and calling each other up and then to witness your husband having such success and the, the trifecta of, of adding Francesca into the mix, because we both know it's just, I think she's like quantum leap bottled up in, in a human form, just. She's like the quantum leap, like elevator operator. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I love that so, so much. So in all of this, I have to ask every day when you wake up, what is the thing that you're reaching for the feeling? Like what's your North star? And I ask that because I truly believe anyone who is making big moves, creating big things in life, they're not focused on the things they're focused on a feeling because that really is the thing that propels us. So what's yours? What's your North star? Impact. You know, and I think we look at that as, yes, we look at that as results, but um, impact because impact also creates influence and influence when properly used is so powerful. And for me, like my, my favorite way to use influence is as a connector. Like I get so much joy from connecting people with other people or things or resources that they need to fulfill their dreams. So that, that's what it is. Um, and that's why I will never not work because I, you're not, there's always going to be more impact to create in the world. Hmm. This is when I peel it back a little bit, a little bit deeper, the, an impact is, is huge. When you are in a place and you know that you're creating impact. What does that feel like for you in your body? <sighs> Contentment, which I know is not a very sexy word, but it's just like, oh, it, I mean, it is, it's validation too, right? Yeah. And not that we have to do things in order to, we shouldn't have to do things to be, you know, I always strive to be focused, connected, joyous, but when I see that impact, it get, lets me know that my life, like, it's partly like living into potential is like my life is as magical as I thought it could be when I was that little girl. Now, maybe it hasn't gone the same direction of like, I'm going to be a famous actress. But you know, the reason when I was eight years old, I wanted to be an actress is because they, they entertain lots of people. Now, I, I hope that what I'm doing now is even more impactful than that, which is I'm giving women specifically tools to change their life and create a huge ripple from that. And I'm hungry for more. 
Yes, I love that. And you know, it's funny that you said, not funny, but contentment. Because I think that that first you might hear that as like being kind of unsexy, but I think that it's not at all. I The idea of being so at peace in your body that you can say that you feel content and there's an element of freedom when you find contentment. And I also, when, I, when you really start to think about contentment and being hungry for, for more, it, they almost sound like they're not, they're like polarizing, but I think that there's this beautiful synergy between the two. Like the other thing is sometimes I actually feel nervous and I actually love that. Um, just like I said, you know, fear, fear is like a good thing. Fear is a good thing because it's, um, it's our thermometer and, and we don't want to be the thermometer, right? We want to be the, what is it called? We want to, what is the thing that you program? I'm looking at my Honeywell over there, the thermostat. thermostat. We want to be the thermostat, right? We want to set the temperature, not react to the temperature. But this morning, I mean, I had one of my clients and, and I'll just, I'll just say nothing gets me more excited. Like, yes, it's great. If I get, you know, a publication, I, I love, I actually love, I love podcasting guesting or not, because I love the conversation. I love the, the connection and the impact. But when I get something exciting for myself, I'm like, okay, this is cool. I'm, this is great. Like, but when my clients have something that excites them, especially that expands them, like the, nothing brings me more excitement. And, and one of our clients last week, um, she released her book. I mean, she literally like left her job just 10 months ago. She has a, a time management goal setting coaching business. And she released her book and went bestseller in seven categories. And I was like, yes, you know, and then we did some PR for, her and she got picked up by 340 publications. Like they reprinted the article that we published or we posted about her. Um, but then today she had a national TV spot. So I was up like, you know, 7 a.m. She got her interview and I was so nervous. And I was like, this, this is, this is just such a sign of good things. Is like when not just I'm doing things that expand me, but when I am helping my clients grow and do things that they're afraid of, like that's what I want because that's what grows the belief muscle. I feel like. I feel like a book's coming on the, the belief muscle. <laughs> it might be. I might have to write that down. Oh, give me another one. I've already got a whole list. <laughs> well, we could add one more to it, right? <laughs> so this is it's time for the super expander moment. Time for for you to kind of if you could give your younger self a little bit of encouragement, a juicy nugget of I don't know, of Intel that if you could just go back, it almost make you dangerous. Like I'd ever say that we would never want to go back and change anything, but this is the kind of stuff that when other people get to hear the advice we might've given ourselves, it can collapse time for them. So what's your, what's your little super expander nugget of gold? Own your magic, like the magic of who you are and what you're about when you put on what do you call a mask, you try to be someone else to fit in. What you're doing is you're basically covering the beacon of light that you are that will attract those that are meant to be connected with you. And so you have got to show up as you. And again, own yourself, own your passion, own your ideas, own your beliefs, you know, unapolog unapologetically. And then the other, just from you know, a life and business standpoint, is getting into messy aligned action. No. We know hypno breath work is the best tool for alignment, but be willing to do it without it being perfect and be willing to do it before you know what the end is. Like if you can see the next step, take it. Oh, that's pure magic happens then, right? We're only, only can really see like one or two steps ahead of us. If we're waiting to see the whole entire picture, we'll have missed the moment. And yeah, so be good. Be here now. So for everyone listening, what is the best way for them to find you, to get into your world? Connect with me. Um, Instagram is good, but also my website, www.rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A, Cafiero, that's C-A-F as in Frank, I-E-R-O.com. And I'm also on Instagram at Rebecca Cafiero. And, you know, shoot me a DM and let's connect. I mean, I, again, I love connecting and supporting with women. And I will say some of the people that I met in the DMs have become dear friends, collaborators, business partners. You know, we're, we're fortunate to live in a world where people are really close if we allow them to be. 
So true. Yeah, you know, I've some of the friends that I've made over the years have actually happened via Instagram. And it, it's crazy because social media it's, it tends to get such a, a bad rap, but it really opens up these opportunity for us as women, as business owners, to not only make connections in business, but actually make real friendships that we would have never, ever, ever had the opportunity to do so because we would have never been in the same room otherwise. Agreed. So, I'm so grateful good. to be in this room with you. Ah, so grateful to be in this room with you and so grateful that you were able to, to carve out some time to chat and share your light and your magic with the super expanders.